Learn about the latest technologic innovations today. And you don't have to pay. Expert panels with advanced degrees are sure to satisfy your curiosity. Didn't we mention it's free. And if you think you'll find a better time than this, then come on down and test your hypothesis. Cause you're gonna learn a lot today if you wanna stay. Down in the Saints Cafe. Welcome back to Science Cafe, New Hampshire. My name is Rick Irving, and I will be your host and moderator for this, our March 2022 episode. Tonight's topic is Big Blood, the science of blood donations. Tonight's Science Cafe is about the crucial role that blood donations provide as a life-saving resource the world over. Blood banks and blood donations are crucial, not just in trauma centers and emergency operating rooms, but also in non-critical surgeries and for chronic disease treatments. In the U.S., someone needs blood or platelets every two seconds. In New Hampshire, 165 pints of blood are needed daily to meet the demand. And generally, that requires 1,100 blood donors every day to achieve that goal. Adding to the equation are the different types of blood donations that can be made. You can do whole blood donations. You can do blood platelet donations. You can do blood plasma donations. Or you can do power red donations. Each of these options can require different procedures and preparations. Each can also require different time commitments on the part of the donor. One goal of the Red Cross is to guide us toward the right type of donation based on your blood type and the patient needs to ensure the best use of your valuable contributions. When you consider that roughly 4% of the population are donors, it is a critical and complex problem. Tonight, our panel can help us understand this daunting task. We have gathered the knowledge and we are ready to answer your questions. However, before I introduce our panel, I have some quick procedural comments for our audience, especially our first time viewers. At Science Cafe, our goal is to bring the public and the experts together to educate through scientific discussion. A vital part of the Science Cafe are the questions submitted by you, our audience, for our expert panel. To submit your questions, use the comments section of Facebook or YouTube, whichever you are using to join us right now. Our colleagues will collect the questions and forward them to us, so I may direct them to the panel. Please be succinct with your questions, and if you would, please at least include where you are joining us from. Since we have gone to this virtual format, it is interesting to see where the questions originate. You may start submitting your questions now and for the remainder of tonight's program. As always, we will get to as many of your questions as our time tonight permits. And now, it is my privilege to introduce you to our panelists for tonight. Hi, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Jorge Rios with us this evening. Dr. Rios is currently the Red Cross Regional Medical Director for Northern New England and Massachusetts. He's been with the Red Cross since 2001. He's also an assistant clinical professor at Tufts University, as well as being board certified in blood bank and transfusion medicine. Dr. Rios, thank you so much for joining us tonight. You're welcome. Why don't you take a few minutes and let, tell us, the audience, a little bit about yourself, your background, your experience. It's about Jorge Rios, and we've been with the Red Cross in Massachusetts and Northern New England, which is Maine, Vermont, and New Hampshire, for 20 years. I joined right after fellowship in 2001, and I oversee the medical operations of the Red Cross in this four-state region. And I guess my mission is to make sure that giving blood for a donor or a patient getting a transfusion is safe for both the donor and the patient. Uh, certainly sounds like we have the right guy for tonight's discussion. So why don't we jump right into the questions? And our first one is, what is the most common blood type and what is the least common? The most common blood type, the universal blood type, is the O blood type. And then the least common is the combination of the A and B blood type, so-called the AB blood type. And that's about 4% of the population. The O, it's about 45% of the population. Hmm. Okay. So what defines the different blood types? How are A, B, AB, and O different? The cells that will carry oxygen from the lungs into the tissues are called the red blood cells. And they begin in so-called ontogeny, how cells develop, as really the precursor, the H blood type, and then the O, kind of the universal. And then the body will add the sugars, carbohydrates, either the A carbohydrate or the B carbohydrate. So to be A, you get the A carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. To be labeled as B, you get the B carbohydrate. 
to be labeled as AB, you get both of them, you know, both, both genes. And donors who are O would not have any of these carbohydrates in their surfaces. They are, you know, kind of bearing the surfaces. Therefore, there could be the universal uh, blood donation for every patient. So it's basically genetics and adding carbohydrates to the red cell, this, the cell that will carry oxygen from the lungs into the various organs of the body. Great, thank you. So when I give blood, how does this impact my body? How long is it going to be until I'm good to go again? Technically, you could give blood, and then you could be give blood again in about eight weeks. For the hemoglobin to fully recover, according to more recent studies, hemoglobin level might take a, little, a bit longer than that. So we encourage donors to take our own supplements if they're going to give blood frequently. And that's fine. It's you know, more than three times a year for a man, more than twice a year for a woman. But basically, you're, we're not taking too much on your total blood volume. We're just taking a limited amount, like a pint, it's 500 milliliters. You could carry on your daily activities, you know, as usual. Of course, the day of the donation, you're going to rest a little bit. But within a few weeks, your hemoglobin levels, if you eat well and get supplementation, will be back to the so-called pre-donation levels. Oh, okay. Now, what sort of diseases would disqualify, disqualify me from giving blood and is having COVID one of those? Okay. Let me tackle the COVID question. So if you recover from COVID, which means no symptoms in the last 10 days, anybody could be a blood donor. So the people that recover from COVID are welcome to give blood. So what are the differences you know, from giving blood? They're dual. They're meant to protect the safety of the donor and the safety of the patient getting the transfusion. So anybody who has a strong cardiac history, let's say, for example, a person had, had a heart attack four weeks ago, you know, for their own benefit, that person should not be giving blood. Anybody who's taken an antibiotic for an infection, who could pass the infection from, by the blood donation from a patient, from a blood donor to a patient, you know, that person, of course, should not be giving blood. So it's, you gotta have a, quote, I'm feeling, you gotta be feeling well. Uh, we gotta make sure the Red Cross that is okay for you. Having things like high blood pressure, diabetes, you know, will allow you to give blood. Uh, hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, that's fine. Again, taking antibiotics is a no. And then anybody with a infection of the, of, of the liver called hepatitis, of course, mm -hmm. and of course HIV, uh, cannot be a blood donor uh, forever in the Red Cross system and across the nation. So those are the basic rules. And the minimum weight is 110 pounds. I need to clarify that. Mm -hmm. uh, the minimum age in New Hampshire, it's 17, uh, 16 years with parental consent. And there's, there's no maximum age, so you could be a blood donor at any age, you know, as you deem fit. So those are the core requirements. Well, interesting, because I was diagnosed with hepatitis about 25 years ago and was told I couldn't give blood. And then I went for another diagnosis later on. I listed some of the things that I thought I'd had, and they said I'd never had um, the diabetes. So, I mean, not diabetes, the, the hepatitis. So I guess I can give blood from now on, right? Yes, if you never had hepatitis from a virus, I'm talking about mm -hmm. hepatitis A as in Abby, B as in Benedict, and C as in Charlie, that could be easily passed on a blood donor to a patient. You are not allowed to give blood in the future. Gotcha. If you had hepatitis from maybe doing too much exercise or obesity uh, or some non-infectious hepatitis in you know, cases, you know, you could be a blood donor because it's not a virus damaging the liver. But of course, anybody giving blood will have to be feeling well the day of the donation. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so what diseases are tested for when you give a blood donation? We have to test the blood types. You know, that's not a disease. You know, find your blood right. type, you will be right. notified. Then we test for HIV 1 and 2, you know, the virus that will cause AIDS. Right. Hepatitis B and, and C. And, um, a rare virus called HTLB 1 and 2. We test also for the parasite that will cause a disease called Babipsia microti in the US and the agent that will cause syphilis. So it's hepatitis, HIV, this HTLB, Babipsia, and syphilis. Those are the core uh, testing requirements currently in the US. We could change at any moment. Uh, we're testing for the Zika virus, that is a virus found in this. Far West made it through South America to the Caribbean to the US, right. but we stopped right. testing for Zika virus because there's no Zika virus currently in the US. So that test got eliminated. 
Interesting. And I understand you just recently started testing for COVID? We're testing for the antibody, which is the immune response of the body to an infection. Mm -hmm. Because we need to find donors that are somewhat selected, donors that were never vaccinated but had the infection ideally, uh -huh. and make this plethora, this variety of antibodies against COVID in order to keep their plasma and send it to patients that are getting chemo or are heavily immunosuppressed and could not you know, respond to a vaccine. So they need to have these preformed antibodies given to them in case they get exposed to COVID or in case they get COVID. For that peculiar patient population, we were, were re requested by the hospitals to collect the so-called COVID because of the virus plasma. So it's COVID convalescent plasma. Convalescent means you recover from the disease. Mm -hmm. So we're collecting the so-called CCP and testing all donors uh, beginning last Thursday. Well, that seems like a fairly significant milestone. It is. We were testing in the at the beginning of the epidemic uh, as a service to the donors and also to be able to collect this COVID convalescent plasma. The treatment for COVID got a lot better, but not perfect. In between, now we've got antivirals and other kind of preformed antibodies made in a lab. But again, and the Food and Drug Administration suggested to the blood centers based on some scientific studies that the cancer patients primarily don't respond to the vaccine and the virus could be mutating. So it's better to collect plasma from somebody who recovered from the virus, you know, hopefully from the st same strain, in this case will be Omicron, and have that plasma ready for that very limited selected patient population that cannot get anything else to overcome a COVID infection or a COVID exposure. Oh, interesting. Thank you. Uh, and we well, we sorry, I'd gone down this path already. Let's continue. What are some of the safety protocol guidelines that the Red Cross adheres to? Well, for COVID, you know, if you're going to give blood, you got to wear a mask. Both the staff members and the phlebotomists and the blood donors, frequent, you know, hand cleaning and frequent cleaning of the surfaces, you know, where, that you touch as a blood donor on the beds that we use, you know, for the collection. For every blood donor, in COVID and not COVID alike, you know, we measure the temperature to make sure they're not infected. That's more of a recipient safety test. But we also measure their blood pressure and the hemoglobin and their pulse. So if their vital, so-called vital signs are not okay, we tell them, and some people have found that they're hypertensive by giving blood, or their hemoglobin is very low, they're anemic. So we make, make this mini, phys mini physical exam to make sure they're okay to give blood. Again, the, uh, the equipment used to do a phlebotomy, a collection, it's single use. So we, you know, open the box, pull the bags, put, put the needles, and then discard it afterwards. You know, single use, nothing gets recycled, and it's, uh, it's sterile. So basically, we protect the safety of the patients and protect the safety of the donors equally to make sure it's safe for both of them, you know, the patient and the donor, to give and receive blood. Great. Thank you. Next question. If you have low iron, what can donors do ahead of time to get those numbers up? They should take, first, like, to consult with their doctors, but they should take iron pills to make sure that if the low uh, or iron is due to, you know, under uh, ingestion of iron, that iron levels will, will increase. It will take a while. That will take, if you go low iron, it will take about 16 weeks to build them up. And then, you know, you can proceed with a donation. We do measure not the iron molecule per se, the hemoglobin molecule. Iron is an element, not a molecule. But we measure hemoglobin, and within the hemoglobin molecule, there's, uh, there's the iron element in the center. So we measure hemoglobin to make sure it's safe for you to give blood. If it's too low, we also tell you you're got a low hemoglobin, not a low iron. But again, you know, as I mentioned before, the hemoglobin molecule that will carry oxygen from the lungs into the tissue is the iron molecule uh, the element in the center to bind it together. And if it's too low, you should take the iron pills if your doctor you know, advises you to mm -hmm. take it. You know. So now what if your iron was too high? I actually had a doctor tell me I had too much iron in my blood at one point. Oh, well, that's a condition that could be possibly called hemochromatosis. That, was, the disease yeah. per se. Hemochromatosis is a function of having a gene that is mutating with two mutations plus another trigger that will make your intestines absorb more iron that will go into the bloodstream and could land in the pancreas and the liver and damage them. Mm -hmm. So for those people that have too much iron and are formally diagnosed with hemochromatosis, we could draw the blood 
as a therapeutic intervention. So we're going to collect the unit of blood in the same manner as a volunteer donor, but we cannot use it for the time being. Things might change, but for the time being, it's a medical service. Don in New Hampshire, the donor center in Manchester, Reservoir Street, and it's uh, meant to treat a patient. Uh, the hemochromatosis patients are advocating for the rules to change, mm -hmm. and we're thinking about changing the rules in the breakfast in the nearby future. So we could draw their blood if they fill all the regular eligibility criteria, mm -hmm. and then use that unit of blood for a transfusion, but not for the time being. We're kind of evaluating the changes and hopefully have them implemented within probably five, six months. Great. Okay. Next question. How do the different types of donations, RBC, platelets, et cetera, differ in helping the recipient? Well, if you give a regular donation, it's called a whole blood donation, mm -hmm. right. which means we take everything in circulation, which are the red cells that carry oxygen, the plasma that will prevent bleeding and the, and the platelets and the white cells. And that would be like a dose for one patient, perhaps a patient may need more than that, especially with the platelets. So we got, we can also do automated donations by a technology called apheresis, which means cell separation. So if you come to the donor center in Manchester, you give platelets and give a full dose of platelets um, for a patient. So he or she would not have to get components from five individuals, they're getting from one donor. And that donation could be a single donation, it could be a double donation or a triple donation. You're giving free dosages for three different patients. So there's multiple ways to give blood. Some of them are manual, some of them are automated. I do need to mention that there's something called power reds in the red cross or double red cells. Right. And we do that in the community with the AFRISIS technology. And that means we bring a, a machine, a cell separator that will draw your blood Keep two units of red cells, especially if your blood type is a universal blood type, as I mentioned before, the O blood type, and return to you the balance, the platelets and the plasma and the white cells. Mm -hmm. So that's also done in the community because the machines are smaller and movable. And then, you know, you can only, you know, you give twice the amount, so you have to wait 16 weeks to give, make the next appointment, but uh -huh. you're give, doing a double contribution in one appointment. So you okay. can help two people by only coming once to the donor center in Manchester or the community blood drives across New Hampshire. So when somebody comes in for something like that, do you say, you know, we want the whole blood or do we want just platelets or plasma or the, the power red? Do you tell them Well, the time? platelets are usually by appointment. And as I mentioned before, you have to do the donation yep. at the donor center in Manchester. Okay. The double red cells, you know, we encourage appointments, you know, we're somewhat flexible, mm -hmm. but uh, when you register to give a blood donation, if you'd like to do so by our application or the web page, you can select, I want to be a double red cell donor. Okay. The ideal double red cell donor has to be kind of the uni more universal or the mostly the blood type, which are, you know, the O's, as I mentioned before, or negative or O positive. And also we need some of the A's uh, on some occasions. Mm -hmm. You got the more rare blood type, the AB blood type. You know, giving by automation and giving two units would not be the best, you know, type of donation to help a patient. But there's variety. You could do manual automated in the community or at the donor center in Manchester. And ideally, if you got some time, you know, it'd be good to have an appointment. So we will honor the appointment and you'll be in and out within an hour, an hour and a half. Oh, excellent. Okay. Next question. Before the blood is collected into the bag, some tubes are collected first. What are they for? The tubes are for the blood typing, the ABO, and for the test for infectious diseases, you know, as I mentioned before, for HIV, hepatitis, HTLB, Babipsia microti, yep. and syphilis. Our testing lab, is, I mean, they have been centralized. There used to be one where my office is in Dedham, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Now, because of economics, our labs are located in North Carolina, uh, Texas, or Arizona primarily, and there's also one in Florida. No, so we send them out by express mail or overnight on an airplane, uh, and they are tested. There, the testing labs will send the results to us electronically as soon as they test. And these labs open 24/7, and they handle um, eight million donations a year, wow. and probably 100,000 different donor samples, you know, uh, a day. So they are very complex operations, but we don't do them locally. We do them right. on a regional national level. And so what percentage of the donations that are collected on a daily basis or what actually go through those centers? 
all of them in the record all system. So all of all hours go Very to fair. Charlotte, depending on the day of the week, or in uh, Dallas, Texas. Wow. No. But the labs are meant to replace each other. The, if there's bad weather in tornadoes in Texas, you know, then we could send the samples to Charlotte and vice mm -hmm. versa. That's kind of the beauty of this multi-state system. They're located next to major airports also. There's plenty of right. flights going to Charlotte, Tampa. Yep. Dallas is a big, you know, hope uh, right. for certain airlines. And the one in Arizona, it's also a big hope. Okay, fascinating. Next, how is blood transported and stored and what is the shelf life? Okay, so the red says once we so-called manufacture them by centrifugation, mm -hmm. they have to be kept very cold at one to six degrees and they could last uh, up to 42 days. So we have to keep them in a cooler while they, well, we send it from the Red Cross uh, manufacturing center to the hospitals. Mm -hmm. So, and then they'll go into a refrigerator within a hospital. And sometimes when they, from the blood bank in the hospital to the nursing floors, they will also perhaps go in a refrigerator. Mm -hmm. The playlists are more sensitive, so they have to be kept at room temperature. And that's 20 to 24 degrees centigrade. But they can only last five days. So we got to collect playlists each day of the week, including you know, Christmas Day and Thanksgiving. So they don't last five days, but they got to be at room temperature. The plasma, is, most of the, it is frozen at minus 18 in a special refrigerator. It could last at minus 18 up to a year. That's kind of the beauty. Oh. But once you thaw it, you know, bring it to room temperature, you have to use it within 24 hours. If not, with some relabeling within, you know, five days. So there's different temperatures for each blood component. I think the most important fact is that platelets only last five days, which means we have to collect for Monday hematology and cardiac right. clinics. We have to collect on Thursday and Friday and Saturday, and even on Sundays for Thursday's transfusions. Hmm. So we're at 27, 24 seven operation. Wow. In Manchester and in, and in across the nation. Great. But what is the percentage of people who cannot donate because of pre-existing conditions? Do we know that? The numbers were estimated to be close to 40%. The data was redone and it's 60%. So technically, 60% of the population in the US could be a blood donor because they have a good vital signs. They lack any risk factor for an infection. The heart condition or lung condition is okay and they're, you know, they're willing to do so, hopefully. I think the big issue is that it's not 60% of the people that are overall po the population are giving blood. It's only three to 4%. That's the entire population. So basically, New Hampshire with maybe 1.2 1, 1. 2 million people, uh, maybe they could be, I'm doing the math in my mind, maybe 60,000 active donors, and don't call me this number, but uh, mm -hmm. and these 60,000 people are supporting the one million plus uh, right. residents of New Hampshire because anybody could need a transfusion at any moment. So we depend heavily on a small portion of the population that we didn't able to give. Any changes to that population, like with COVID, then there's not enough blood components and there are blood shortages. So I think the bigger picture here is that only a few people give for the bulk of us. And maybe that few percentage could be increased. And regrettably, you know, that has hasn't happened and, um, across the nation and recently. So it's always a big concern. Yes, I'm sure. And I think we're going to come back to that as well. Okay. Next question is, what are some common medications that would prevent a person from donating? I think the number ones that are I've seen that are most heavily used are antibiotics. There's lots of people that are taking an antibiotic for an infection that are acute or chronic. Of right. course, if it's an acute infection, and most of the chronic, you cannot be a blood donor because you could have a, a bacteria that could easily pass from the blood donor to the blood There's recipient a, yeah. in the blood bag. So I encounter lots of people with antibiotics that I, we have to tell them, wait until you're done taking the antibiotics and come and give blood. Some of the medications for the uh, prostate hyperplasia, like proscarin propitia and hair thinning, uh, could damage a fetus if the fetus, if the blood donation is given to a woman who's carrying a baby in the womb. Mm -hmm. So if you're taking proscan and propitia, finasteride, et cetera, you cannot be a blood donor unless you stop taking the medication. But we tell donors, your health is most important. Keep taking the medication, you know, because your health is almost important. 
And then some of the newer antiplatelet agents, and um, I'm not gonna mention any trade names, but they're rather strong. So uh, you're taking them and thinking of giving players that'd be impossible because the player will be inactivated. And some of the anticoagulants, Again, they're rather potent, so we don't want to put a needle into anybody who could bleed excessively. So therefore, if you're taking one of these anticoagulants that you see on TV uh, <laughs> daily, then you should not be giving blood for your own well-being. Uh, you should not take, stop taking them. You always have to follow your doctor's advice. So I think these are the, the bigger categories, the antibiotics heavily, mm -hmm. the antiplatelet anticoagulants, and this so-called insane teratogenic, you know, medicines that could damage a fetus uh, like the prostate, you know, hyperplasia, prostatic hyperplasia medicines that would not, not allow you to give blood. Mm -hmm. If you got diabetes, you know, high, high blood pressure, you could be a blood donor. Hyper and hypothyroidism, mm -hmm. you could be a blood donor. Some of the newer immunosuppressants uh, for chronic diseases of the immune system, you could be a blood donor. You know, those are mm -hmm. fine. So some, some of our audience out there is thinking about being a donor and they're taking some antibiotics. How long would they have to be off the antibiotics to be safe to go ahead and donate? At least one day. So they should not be taking oh, any right. antibiotics the day of the donation, but they should be also free of the infection. If they're still feeling the toothache, you know, uh, then you know, they should not be giving blood. They should be feeling well that day also. It's a combination of the resolution of symptoms and then and, and the last day of taking the medication. Okay, great. Next question. How much did blood donation go down during the pandemic? Good question. Well, during the pandemic, we had a big fear of donors not showing up, you know. Uh, sure. So luckily, the donors came through, the very brave and dedicated donors. They tend to be kind of the older folks, you know, over age 65. Yeah. And then the uh, sites that we could do blood drives, the schools were closed and the companies were closed. People were working from home. Right. So we went into churches and community centers uh, to draw blood during the pandemic. And this past summer, society somewhat reopened, you know, before the Omicron variant and the Delta variant came into the U.S. Mm -hmm. So we had uh, an increased demand of blood for blood components because patients were going back to having their surgeries. So we had an increased demand for blood components. Right. But donors probably went to the beach and took some time off. So we had an, an imbalance between donors giving blood and hospitals having a high demand for blood components. Right. And I think it became very acute this past, I would say, November through so-called national blood shortage in the Red Cross and the other blood centers, where the reduction in donors was about 10%. Uh, and then the reduction in sites that would have a blood drive was about 65%. No high school kids, no college kids. So it was rather scary for a while. We managed to come through, and now we're in the upswing because we got more donors willing to give. And we had to hire a bit more staff. We had some losses. So we're hiring more people and going back to usual. So we had a hard time with COVID, you know, at the beginning and most recently, but we're doing a lot better now. Oh, that's great news. Okay, next Indeed. question. On a national scale, how does the Red Cross manage to balance supply and demand over such a large geography? We're a national organization and we collect broad all the way from Portland, Oregon to uh, South Carolina and Georgia, from uh, Bangor, Maine to San Diego, California. So we cover the entire nation. We collect 40% of all the donations in the US. So there's other blood banks and other blood hospitals that collect blood. But we have a national inventory management system. So we balance the needs of uh, uh, patients and hospitals across the nation on a 24 seven basis. So say for example, there's bad weather in the winter in, Northern New England, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, we cannot collect blood. Then the Red Cross regions in California will send blood to, right. uh, or the Midwest will send blood to uh, the Northeast. Same, these tornadoes in Georgia, then we send blood from the Northeast to Georgia. So it's kind of done on a centralized basis. Mm -hmm. Your donation can go to anywhere in the US as it's needed, you know, as needed. Uh, if weather is bad, then we help the other Red Cross regions and the other hospitals because they also need blood components when things are bad for them because of weather. Right. So it seems like, you know, that's going to be a real-time decision because those things happen without much notice. So there must be a pretty robust system that you have there. Yeah, there's 
Variability planning for collections, you know, when you could operate and stop operating. Mm -hmm. And then for uh, deciding where, once the components are tested and labeled, where they should go. By experienced people, as I mentioned before, they work, you know, every day of the week, every hour of the day. Right. To make sure we are okay, you know, we depend on air, air transportation. You know, there's more flights in the daytime than, you know, at 12 midnight. But we could take the donation, the, the boxes of blood to uh, like hospital, uh, airport like Logan and send it anywhere there's an airplane as is needed. Or we yeah. drive it there also, drive it to Philadelphia or Albany, New York, or pick another city, Columbus, Ohio. Sure. Um, okay, on the topic of resources, do we have enough phlebotomists and how are they trained? Well, we're looking for phlebotomists, you know, uh, each and every day. And you need to have a high school degree. We do, you know, lectures for them. It's called on the job training. So they get a didactic component from the Red Cross on how to do a, take a vital sign, do a blood pressure, a, a temperature measurement, a pulse, how to do a phlebotomy, how to manage the scales for a blood collection, how to handle a donor reaction. That takes between six to 10, 12 weeks for them to work independently. Oh. So uh, we need phlebotomists. We had some people leaving because of multiple re reasons recently. We will do the training in-house, you know, at no cost to the employee, they get paid. They get under their supervision. And once they we feel confident that they could work independently, they are so-called released to task. They could work independently. Oh, interesting, that's great. Oh, here's a very interesting question. We hear a lot about pig organs being used in human transplants. Is there an analogous synthetic blood or a suitable substitute? Scientists have tried for, I would say, decades to make artificial blood and regrettably they failed. So there were some so-called hemoglobin carriers, oxygen carriers, that was primarily hemoglobin from a cow. You know, that's what it was with a lipid layer. And they tried that and the companies, one of them was even based in Cambridge, but they were not successful at you know, making that feasible because the these oxygen carriers led to hypertension in the recipients. Uh, so that failed for uh, red cells. The, for platelets, there's nothing artificial and nobody trying actively to make an artificial platelet. Some of the plasma proteins, uh, the coagulation factors like factor eight could be made in a lab. These are, they're called recombinant clotting factors. And they are the ones that are advised for a patient with hemophilia. So there's a few recombinant clotting factors uh, they tend to be very expensive, available in the nation. But there's 13 protein factors and other plasma proteins, and we only have some, you know, factor A, factor seven, factor ten available on a recombinant basis. So the bottom line: we're not at the stage in the U.S. or in the, in the world for having artificial blood. It's really blood from humans that will go to another human. Hmm. In the U.S., it's a non-paid volunteer donor system, so it's a volunteer right. donor given for anybody in the community. So we don't have any artificial blood uh, yet. Hopefully we might have something, but it's very complex. It, uh, right. Red cells and the other proteins are very unique. You know, the red cells don't have any nucleus, you know, but they're, they could bend as they travel through the, you know, the cells. They could take in and out, you know, potassium. So they're very clever and metabolically active without having the brains and nucleus to tell them, you know, what to do or not to do. Okay. Next question, what are the different cell types in blood and what do they do? So the red cells that look red, you know, would carry oxygen from the lungs into the tissues and would carry carbon dioxide from the tissues into the environment via the lungs. The platelets are parts of cells called mega, uh, megakaryocytes. So the portion of the mega, megakaryocytes that go into circulation are used to prevent bleeding. And then the plasma proteins are made in the liver. They're not really made in the bone marrow, but they travel, they travel for circul uh, by circulation and together with the platelets, they mix together, it's like brick and mortars, and they will, you know, prevent somebody from bleeding from a lesion in the blood vessels, you know, they will make a, a blood clot or blood plug, you know, one of those two, they're about the same. Mm -hmm. So these are the cells, red cells for oxygen, uh, cells per se, platelets, you know, and then the mortar, the plasma to prevent bleeding, the last two. Okay. 
Uh, next question is, can a recipient have an allergic reaction to donated blood? And if so, what drives that? Some patients are very hypersensitive and when they get especially plasma components or platelets, they will react to the plasma, non-specific proteins in the donor plasma and have an allergic reaction. It could be mild, it could be severe, it could be something called anaphylaxis. They tend to be rare, but they do happen. And again, the chance of this happening again, it's very low because the donors are different, you know, for, for each donation. But some people are very hypersensitive and prone to be reacting to when they're exposed to anything for aim. Hmm. So there are allergic reactions primarily for plasma transfusions and platelets, and some for, and some of also for some of the red cells. We could do something called washing, which is using saline to remove the plasma from platelets or from red cells, and then minimize allergic reactions you know, preemptively. So that's a mitigation. As I told a surgeon once, if you remove plasma from plasma, you're left with saline. So for plasma, there's no remedy for this. These patients that have severe reactions, they get heavily premedicated. And when they get confused, you know, the doctors are by the bedside, so they have the epinephrine ready in case there's a, a severe reactions. And then the doctors minimize transfusions. They only transfuse whenever the need uh, is absolute. So indeed, there's some reactions to a transfusion. There's some mitigation for them. I think the best practice that we tell doctors, if you don't think the patient needs a transfusion, you know, don't, do, don't give the transfusion. Right. Very interesting. Next question. What is the RH factor in blood typing? Okay, I mentioned there's the A, B, A, B, and O blood types. But there's also the second most important system is the so-called the D gene, having the D, it's a, pro, uh, it's a protein, the D protein or not having it. So if you have that D, I'm gonna call it factor, you're called positive. You could be O positive, B positive, A, B positive. If you don't have it, uh, you're called negative. But the issue is that the bulk of the population has the factor the D factor, so they're positive when we do the blood typing. If you don't happen not to have that uh, protein on your surface, then you're called negative. But if you're giving blood but from somebody who has the protein, which you know by chance is 85% chance, then you could become sensitized. But by that I mean you could make an antibody, an immune response to the, that so-called benign D protein. And in certain settings that could be very deleterious, say for example, in a woman who's uh, pregnant, the baby could be uh, D negative, and the mother is D positive. There's always fetal maternal bleeding. The mother could become sensitized to the fetal cells and make this antibody. The antibody could cross the placenta and damage the, the baby. So in certain scenarios, you know, we have to match for ABO, and for the D uh, protein, the D factor, especially if women of childbearing age, as I mentioned before, or if you make the anti-D from a transfusion, then we really have to give you arch negative blood, D negative blood. But that's only 15% of the population. It's more difficult to find it. It's there, but it's you know harder to find. Very good. Next question. What happens if someone with type A is accidentally given type B blood? Well, that would be a so-called hemolytic transfusion reaction. So basically, hemolysis means this destruction of the red cells. So if you are A, you got that, that A carbohydrate that I mentioned before in your red cells. Uh, if you are B, you know, you don't, you, have, you don't have the A, you have the B carbohydrate, but you learn to make anti-A naturally by six months of age. So you're giving a patient who has the A uh, carbohydrate in the surface, a component with plasma from somebody who made to make the anti-A because the bodies are different. And that anti-A antibody could destroy the red cells, uh, could be immediate and could lead to death if, you know. Uh, so we gotta be very careful, you know, when we give a transfusion, sometimes hospitals repeat the blood type twice of the patient to make sure, you know, it's the correct type. If not, they will give the universal blood type, the O blood type. But basically, you cannot take anybody's blood type for granted. So even if I go to a hospital and I will tell them I'm AB, the hospital will have to repeat the blood type because they cannot trust me. They want to trust them. 
So how, how long would it take to determine somebody's blood type like that? It's about 15 minutes, you know, once you get the sample yeah. in the lab, you know, the harder part is getting the sample from the OR or the ER to the lab. Uh, so, but some places they want two blood types. So you have to have something in the record in the computer system. If not, you get O's at the beginning and then you get with a second row type specific, A for A's, B for B's, A, B's right. for A, B's, and O's for O's. Or no, we take no chances because somebody's life is at the end. Oh, sure. Okay. Can blood donation of the same type help blood diseases like sickle cell or hemophilia? Okay, Simon, let me deal with hemophilia. Hemophilia, it's not really an issue of blood types. It's lacking at the factor eight. And so if you lack factor eight congenitally, like the sons of the Russian, the son of the Russian Tsar, the last one, then you need to get factor eight, you know, that clotting factor. And the ideal way to get it, you know, to get it, the one made in the lab, the so-called recombinant factor eight. So you go to the clinic or you get it administered at home and then Every week you get an infusion, every other week of just factor eight, where that's what you're lacking, what you need. Um, for sickle cell disease, the situation is more complex. Uh, sickle cell disease is found of, in African-Americans, some Hispanics, some people from the Mediter Mediterranean area. And their genes are different. The so-called uh, genes uh, that will show in the red cell surfaces are somewhat different. So when you classify the blood in, in the broader sense, you know, you look at the O blood type and the D, but there's also other factors like Duffy and Kale, other proteins. Um, they don't match the overall donor population in the US, which is primarily Caucasian. So we are doing a big campaign to recruit minority donors and, and ethnic donors so they could give blood with the intent of having blood that is compatible for this minor uh, antigens and minimize hemolysis, red cell destruction in these patients and make them less prone to make antibodies to, to find blood that is more similar to them. So in a certain case scenario, indeed blood from the, somebody from the same racial and ethnic group will benefit you. Regrettably, you know, the minority donors are only probably 7% of all the donors in the US. Mm. We gotta do a better job at recruiting them. So 7% of the 4% that are donors? No, of the, of the, you look at 100% of the donors, okay. let's say in the Red Cross, the bulk of them are Caucasian, at least in the Northeast. And then the no Caucasian donors of no Hispanic ancestry, it's about 7%. It's not too much, no proportional to the population. That varies state by state. I acknowledge that, but there's always a big gap between the donor base and the recipient base, especially for sickle cell patients. Right. They need to be transfused almost mostly because their red cell will stick for circulation and will not travel and they'll be destroyed and they get tremendous pain episodes, strokes, MIs at age six or seven of age. Oh, wow. So it's a very complex situation uh, that needs a very peculiar solution. Great, thank you. Next question, whether donating or receiving blood, is there a rate of transfer of the fluid that is critical to maintain? And what if the blood is transferred too fast? Well, so donating blood, we set the limit if it's whole blood to a maximum 14 minutes. So the needle will be in your vein, if it's a manual donation, up to 14 minutes. Okay. Most donors give, you know, by after seven minutes, we collect the half, half a liter, the one pint. So that's controlled by the people that do the phlebotomy, the collection with, right. you know, certain parameters. If it's about to, placed by automation or double red cells, we have a time limit, but that's a machine that will control how much we take, how much fluid you get, saline and anticoagulant and your own blood that will return. So it's also, that's also a control, control operation. If you're gonna get a, you're a patient in a hospital, you know, and you need a transfusion, usually for red cells, which are the most common transfusions, it's over a four hour period. But you're bleeding, you know, excessively for an accident, then they will do rapid infusion. They will give you that unit red cells with a pump and you get what you need that you're losing in, within a couple of minutes, you know. Mm -hmm. Depends on the scenario, the situation. So we know when to turn fuse and at what rate. And donations, same thing. We know when to collect and at what rate we should be drawing blood and replacing fluids. Okay, I never would have thought of that question. Very good. Next question, are there any health benefits for the blood donor if they donate on a regular basis? 
there, there was at some point in time the there was a fear that too much iron in the bloodstream will lead to detrimental effects in the non-hemochromatosis population. Yep. And some authors published papers saying that if you give blood frequently, then you're going to do better. Granted, you got to keep in mind, donors are more health conscious and maybe take better care of their health and also they're more generous. So they're not reflective in terms of health of the regular population, you know, put it this way. They probably do more exercise and eat less fat, fatty foods than you know, uh, a random person. So the notion that giving blood will make your health outcomes better, it's not 100% proof uh, with the data. You know, there could be more studies done, but that's the thinking right now. So you give blood to help somebody else so you could feel well. So the benefits more, you know, psychological than physiological. It would make a good slogan. Right. <laughs> okay, the next question. Does blood need to be treated after donation? We don't, we only do the tests. So we, well, you know, so we are trying to prevent a patient from becoming infected for an, with an infection. So for most donations, we only rely on the blood donor test for HIV and hepatitis. For the platelets, there's two ways to mitigate a, a bacteria from making it from the patient, from the donor to the patient. Because remember, platelets are kept at room temperature, and that's idea for a bacteria to grow. So we could do other two things. We could do a culture, if you get platelets, uh, of your platelet donation, and if there's any bacteria in that donation, and if there's any bacteria, we're going to discard the donation and tell the donor of the presence of bacteria in his or her own blood or platelets. There's also a newer technique called pathogen inactivation or reduction done for platelets and approved by the Food and Drug Administration, where we could use a chemical to treat the donation. We are not, we're not going to do the test for bacteria. We're going to use the chemical, treat the donation preemptively with the chemical, and then that chemical, it's validated to kill almost every organism, HIV and hepatitis, Zika, et cetera, Babipsia. Uh, in case, you know, the donor is recently infected and the tests are, you know, in the so-called window period, they are negative because of so, such a recent infection. Mm -hmm. So we could treat the platelets with the culture or do the culture, do the inactivation of the reduction for platelets. For red cells and plasma, it's primarily blood donor testing and blood donor questions. Interesting. Okay. Now, what security risks come with running a blood bank? Can blood go bad or get contaminated? Well, indeed, you know, it's a donation from a human that would have a, a bacteria, and he or she would not have, know that they got an abscess in a tooth, you know, and they could be right. spitting bacteria into circulation. So, indeed, you know, we take the greatest care of a donation, we treat it like gold. But again, if you don't know it's recently infected and with no symptoms, it could be the case that he or she's harboring bacteria, giving blood and passing it to the patient. Contamination of a blood component in the Red Cross and, a, okay. and at the hospital is very rare and really happens because we try to keep the components in a sterile condition. So again, it's primarily donors that are recently infected that could pass an infection to a patient uh, because no test will detect an infection within you know seconds. It will take a while for the test to be positive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ah, so what is the appro approximate cost associated with each blood donation, including research, testing, distribution, and the donation? Well, that sounds complicated. Well, there's no cost for the donors. You know, that's the bottom line. Right. You know, they give for free, and we give them some cookies. Sometimes we have gift cards that people give to us so we could pass them, pass them along. We are, I mean, any blood center, including the Red Cross, you know, we're a nonprofit agency with no federal or state funding. So we got to pay our employees, you know, which are full-time employees that need, he you know, heavy duty training. We need to have a big computer system and a national blood distribution and transportation operation. So we pass the cost of our operation to the hospitals and they could pass it to the patient, to the insurance, depending on the state and the insurance company. So depends on the component, but in the, indeed there's a cost for you know, getting a transfusion because we got to support the collection process and the testing process, the information system and the recruitment process. So I don't want to give any specific numbers. Um, I think our intent is not to make money in the Red Cross, 
and so it's just to service patients. But again, you know, the blood centers in the U.S. are not part of the government. They're independent agencies that need to be self-sufficient financially. Okay. Uh, oh, it looks like we have a supply chain uh, person in the audience today. Are there any? Are there currently any supply chain issues in getting the materials to collect blood? There have been some reports of supply uh, issues with some of the blood bags. <laughs> Uh, locally, not so much for the records operations. Mm -hmm. I think the bigger supply issue is that we were not getting donors recently. <laughs> that was the bottom line. So staffing was a little bit less than ideal, but the donor base was not up to par. The sample tubes and the bags, etc. we had plenty of them. Again, we're a big you know, organization. Um, so basically, it's easier for us to access you know, inventory. But again, for every blood bank, motivating donors to go and, and give as we reopen society, it's been right. a challenge lately. Right. Uh, one more question. Does demand for blood run in cycles? And how has demand been changing over time? So we saw from 2008 to, and all the way to 2008, a big increase in the demand for blood. For multiple reasons between 2008 and recently, I would say just pre-COVID, there was a decrease in uh, demand. And then just before pre-COVID, we had an increase. Then COVID came and things were totally undone. Remember, hospitals were closed for elective surgery. You could not go to your doctor. People delayed care because they did not want to you know, go to a facility and be exposed to COVID. So now we're reopening society. What we're seeing is that Patients that never got care and needing their hip surgeries and patients that were afraid of, you know, getting a transfusion are willing to go and go to the hospital and get their chemo and need a transfusion. So the demand comes and goes. So we saw a peak on all the way to 2008, a decrease, an increase pre-COVID. And then lately, for retos in particular, a slight increase in the demand because I think society is reopening and the number of people that are baby boomers needing you know, hip surgeries and knee surgeries are increasing. And so we're kind of in the upswing of the need for blood donors. And remember only 4% of the population, even 3% give blood, you know, any slight change in them will diminish the inventory tremendously. Okay, so this is gonna be our next to the last question. If someone can't donate blood, how else can they help the cause? Well, there could be volunteers at the blood drive at the canteen or registration they could also organize blood drives that they like at their churches, or schools, or communities. Oh. Maybe once a year, give it a try. They could also find donors, you know, and tell your family members, you know, I cannot give because X, Y, and C. Can you be a blood donor in my name? And let me try once a year. So there's multiple ways to service the community, being at the blood drive as a volunteer, organizing blood drives, and even recruiting donors among your friends, you know, in order of you know, a relative will pass away and their memory, their good memories, oh, uh, or you point. overcame cancer and now you're cancer free. Maybe you cannot give for one year, but you could know, send some your friends to get blood on your behalf. Mm -hmm. And to, to, we have um, put your website across the, the screen a couple of times during this issue. Is that who they should call if they want to help in some other way than donating? Yeah, so they could go to the, the main website. It's called www Red Cross you know, without the blood word, you know, .org, if you want to volunteer, yep. if you want to know, know more about blood donations, it's recrossblood.org, but either one will get you to the other one. Okay. And if you want to make an appointment, it's simple, just call 1-800-RED-CROSS. Or there's an app also for smartphones, you could download the app and make the appointment uh, on your own, at your own leisure. Great. Okay, so this will be our last question for the evening. If there is just one thing that you would like the audience to remember from this discussion tonight, what would that be? Well, they need to remember there's no artificial blood and we need blood components and blood transfusions happen every moment. So it's really a volunteer donor giving an hour of their time, saving up to free people, but there's no other solution to this. It's volunteer blood from the healthy patient uh, donor to a patient in need. Uh, Dr. Rios, thank you so much. I think we certainly had the right gentleman for the panel tonight. Exactly. That was excellent. Thank you so okay. much. Have a good night. Okay, for everybody. Now, a reminder for our audience that you can rewatch this episode <clears throat> shortly after we're done this, tonight, which will be in just a couple of minutes. And you can also go to our website at sciencecafenh.org 
and take a look at six or seven years worth of topics that you can uh, take, a, take a look at as well if you find something of interest. Uh, so I want to thank everybody in the audience for, for their questions and thank everybody for tuning in. I especially want to thank Dr. Rios. You, you were very generous with your time and your knowledge. We really appreciate that. Um, next, next month, Science Cafe will be on Wednesday, April 20th. And until then, we're going to say goodbye to everybody. Have a great night. Have a nice St. Patrick's and safe St. Patrick's Day tomorrow. So long, everybody. Thank you very much.